I hate reading instructions. I hate reading instructions, especially Ikea instructions. I'd rather to pretend to be Chip Gaines than to try to decipher the Swedish hieroglyphs that are Ikea's instructions. But sadly, what happens in my pride is I tend to assemble things in a certain way where there's tons of leftovers. There's screws over there and pins over there and three or four extra pieces. And when you go to wobble the dang thing, it's, uh, it's like a rocking chair, right? I, I don't know if you can relate when it comes to Ikea stuff. Who has time for those instructions? But what happens is as I neglect the instructions and try to step into my mastery carpentry skills and, and, and create the thing better than Ikea had intended it to be, what happens is I create something incomplete, and far from Ikea's ideal. I create something subpar and far from Ikea's ideal. And in a similar way, many of us have neglected to read the instructions of sexuality. And because of that, we create these creations that are fall short from God's ideal. They're incomplete. And I know for me, that's been, that's been my journey. Growing up, I really, with my dad, my birds and bees conversation was about three words from my father. I learned more about sexuality from sex ed, my homies in the entertainment industry, than anything else. Like, I think I learned more about sexuality from 50 Cent in the movies uh, than I actually learned from anything else. And maybe you can relate with me. It's a funny thing, isn't it? Sexuality being such an important part of us of who we are, and we don't give it much time in the family, not only in the family biologically, but the family of God. And so today, hopefully, what we're going to do is we're going to take 30 minutes and cram as much on this topic in as possible to give us a firm foundation of at least where to begin when it comes to sexuality and physical intimacy. Now, let's be honest. I don't know one preacher who could get up here and in 30 minutes, do this justice. And so really think of this as syllabus day. This isn't even a crash course to 101 on physical intimacy. This is syllabus day. It's as if we're showing the trailer for The Hobbit when talking about the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit trilogies. There's just not enough time. There's just not enough time. So I want to encourage you to have grace in this, and if you have questions that you are hoping that I answered this morning, I want to invite you to email us at lincolninfo at anchortacoma.org, and let's set up a time either with me or one of the pastors to talk through this, because this is important stuff, right? This is important stuff, and we all have questions, experiences, stories, And we're all wading through these things to try to figure out where we land and how to discern what life looks like in light of our sexuality. So I want to encourage you to reach out to us. We'd love to sit down and talk with you. And remember what I said last week. You can let your guard down a little bit. We're not here to beat you up. We're not here to to, to rough you up, but to build you up in light of God's word and the person of Jesus. So with that said, let's pray and we'll jump into it. God, we just thank you. We thank you for your grace and your mercy, no matter how far we've gone, no matter how deep we've gone, God, that you are always there for us, that your grace is sufficient, that you are awaiting us to come to you and to seek your grace, to cast ourselves upon your mercy. So God, we just pray uh, that this morning you would give us a sense of peace and a sense of confidence in your word and who you are, Jesus. Lord, we love you, we bless you, and pray all this in your name, Jesus, amen. So the first thing we see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 9, is we see uh, Paul doing something that's countercultural. He's doing something countercultural. What does he say about marriage? He says, hey, if you can't control your desires, get married. Now, when we read that, Some of us might think that Paul is cheapening marriage. He might be degrading marriage or selling marriage short. But this isn't the only passage of Scripture where Paul talks about marriage. In fact, he says in other passages of Scripture not to talk bad about marriage, not to degrade marriage. But what he is doing here is he's taking 
marriage and physical intimacy from the apex of where we've placed it in culture, saying this is the pinnacle of human relationships, and he's bringing that down to where it belongs. He's saying, hey, marriage, physical intimacy is not the end-all, be-all of, of relationships. In fact, I would argue, predicated on the writings of Paul and throughout Scripture, that physical intimacy is actually the third most important intimacy, where spiritual intimacy and relational intimacy far outweigh physical intimacy. You can survive good and well without physical intimacy. Just ask Jesus. So what Paul is doing is he's bringing that down and giving us a healthy understanding of intimacy. And when he does so, he's saying, hey, sexuality does not equal identity. Sexuality does not equal your identity. That's what culture has fed us for a while now, right? Culture says that, hey, listen, your sexuality is your identity, Everywhere we go, we are indoctrinated with sexuality. The magazines at the checkout aisle, the, the ads on Facebook and Instagram, movies, music, it's everywhere. And what the overwhelming, reoccurring messaging is, is, hey, this is the pinnacle of what it means to be human. This is what you should be striving for. More than money, more than friendships. More than God, you should be striving for this pleasure. And this is what we grow up in. This is what we have grown up in. And the seed of this is actually Freud. Freud, what he did is he boiled down human identity into our sexuality. He says this is the basis. Uh, this is the basis for what it means to identify as a human. And you mix that in with the sexual revolution of the 60s and you get a potent mix for us to view sexuality as our identity. And so this is what we see reoccurring throughout scripture. And what this does ultimately is it cheapens our identity, right? It cheapens. If we just say, hey, listen, uh, all that you are, the pinnacle of who you are is your sexuality, it totally neglects the many facets of human uh, identity. It takes the diamond that is the human identity and it makes one facet the whole thing. Instead of saying, hey, no, my sexuality is just a part of who I am. It's not the totality of who I am. Think of it like this, like a grocery bag. If I'm walking out of Fred Meyer, you might see my grocery bag, identify it as a Fred Meyer bag or a Safeway bag or a Walmart bag or a TJ Maxx bag, whatever the bag is, but it's neglecting the fact that there's a diverse range of items within that bag. The bag, the label on the bag is not the most important label. And so similarly, when we label ourselves as I'm this, I'm that, I prefer this, I prefer that, we're, we're really making something that is tertiary primary. And so think of it like this. You stay-at-home moms. We've got some stay-at-home moms in here. If you look at a stay-at-home mom, that's all she is. It's neglecting so much more about that woman. So much more about that woman. She does so much more than stay at home with the kids or stay-at-home dad, right? A stay-at-home dad does so much more than just be a stay-at-home dad. And so in a similar way, we can't just pigeonhole our identity as whatever our sexuality is. So culture wants us to make our identity about our sexuality, but sadly, this fallacy has seeped its way into church culture. Maybe you've heard recently about purity culture. It's, it's being written about all over the internet in light of the Me Too movement and some other movements going on in culture right now. And the purity culture has its roots in the 90s, and the, the whole premise of purity culture was to get kids to marriage without sleeping with somebody else. So the, the importance of purity culture was to get people into marriage as virgins. And so it made, it made purity, it started, what it started to do is communicate that, hey, listen, purity is about your sexual purity. Are you being physically intimate with other people outside of marriage? Then you are impure. You are impure. And what it did was it equated purity with sexual purity. And so instead of viewing purity as a holistic thing, it again took the facet and made the facet the diamond. 
And so if you want to know if you're pure or not, if you're holy or not, if you're righteous or not, when was the last time you went to that website? Did you make out with your boyfriend or girlfriend? Did you put your hand on their kneecap? These were some of the indications of whether or not you were pure and holy. And if you know anything about Jesus, Jesus cares more about us than just our sexuality. He cares about our totality. He wants our total being to be pure. He makes our total being pure. And so that's where you get the small groups with men and women who say they, they, they measure, they base their purity, they base their righteousness off of when was the last time they looked at that site. When was the last time that they slept with their girlfriend instead of looking at it from a to total viewpoint? So when was the last time they talk about greed? How are they spending their money? When was the last time they talked about their language and their jokes? When was the last time they talked about their scripture reading plan or their prayer plan? That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter because it's been two days since I looked at that thing. We what happens is in these groups and this messaging throughout the church is that we started to equate our purity with our sexual purity. And it falls short of what God is calling us to be, who God is calling us to be. And it's made an idol out of this facet. The second thing we see within the purity culture is this graceless rhetoric. Maybe you've uh, heard of these illustrations and analogies that were used. Maybe it was the rose. If I were to stand up here and give Dan a rose and let him pass it around and then brought back to me, it would be mangled. And I'd say, look it, nobody wants this rose, do they? Well, neither would they want you if you slept around. Or they use the duct tape illustration where they peel it and stick it back, peel it and stick it back until it does not stick anymore. And says, look it, who wants this piece of tape? Ain't nobody want this piece of tape as if anybody wanted a piece of duct tape in the church. We don't want that piece of tape, pastor. But what they were doing was communicating this graceless message that, hey, if you have made some physical intimate mistakes, you are worthless. That's what we hear, right? That's what I heard. When I first came into the church and started to hear these messages, that's what I heard. Oh man, I'm less than. Jesus doesn't really want me. And so there's this graceless rhetoric being spread around the church, and it, it wasn't just from the stage. It was in one-on-one -on -one conversations with leaders and pastors. As I was preparing for this message, my heart was breaking as I was hearing these accounts of these stories of women, predominantly women, coming to pastors and leaders in the church saying, hey, listen, this youth pastor did this. This small group leader did this. I, someone did this to me. And the conversation or, or the response would be, well, why did you dress that way? You shouldn't have been in that situation to begin with. And what it does is it takes the focus on the perpetrator where it should be in producing justice. And it focuses it on the victim. It focuses on the victim. This is an ungodly predisposition towards a victim, isn't it? Is this the way Jesus would respond to a victim? No, but because of this purity culture, that's what started to develop within the church, these responses. And I have to say, if you're here and you've been responded to in such a way, I, I, I want to apologize on behalf of the church and let you know as your pastor and a brother in Christ that I'm here for you and I'm sorry for what you've gone through. And I'm, I'm here if, there, if you need anything. Our pastoral staff, we're here if you need anything as you process through that. It's a horrific injustice. But this purity culture equating the facet to the whole has led to these responses towards victims. And what does that do? It sets an unbearable burden of guilt, long-term guilt, on that individual so how can they be in true community? How can they grow in Christ? How can they grow in their understanding of Jesus and their love for Christ when that was the messaging that they got from the people who were supposed to be serving God? It's twisted. It's twisted. And so this is the fruit. This is some of the fruit, the spoiled fruit from this culture. Now, as I say this, as I critique purity culture, we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. A lot of times we just want to swing the pendulum the other way and wild out a little bit. But purity is still important. 
It's not about getting rid of this notion of purity lived out in each and every one of our lives, but it's to broaden it. To say, hey, listen, just because I stumbled last week does not make me a heathen. It does not make me a, a, a child of wrath. It means I gotta repent for that and keep going, but I'm also working on my generosity. I'm also working on giving. I'm also working on serving. I'm also working on fill in the blank, walking in the spirit. And so we can't focus, we can't narrow it in on one facet. So the way forward in the midst of these, these two ways that culture and the church has dealt with uh, physical intimacy and our sexual identity is to ground ourselves in our identity in the person of Christ. Like we've talked about that, right? We've talked about that in Ephesians where Paul is saying, hey, put Jesus in the center of it all. Let Jesus be the lens by which you see everything in front of you. Let Jesus be the defining factor in what is good and what is not good. And remember, you are a temple for the Holy Spirit. More than just an image bearer, you are a temple and a child of God. You are a prince and a princess. You are a son and a daughter. You are a child of God. You are a child of God. And he has given you, he has given you parameters, boundaries for human flourishing in his word. And purpose and meaning in his word. That's where we ground ourselves. It's not in what culture says. It's not even what church culture has said about identity. But it is what Jesus says about our identity. That is what we live in light of. Amen? Amen. And that's a good identity, isn't it? It's a glorious identity. It's an identity with boundaries, but important things tend to have boundaries, don't they? I think of my son, McCoy. He's growing up right now, and he's screaming in the middle of church, which I know he's just shouting me down, so I, I love it. I'm sorry for the rest of you. Um, but he's running around. He's getting his teeth. He's growing up. He's, he's making noises. He's, he's, he's maturing. And in the midst of that, what he's doing is he's growing into his identity as a lion, He's growing into an, his identity as a lion. Year after year, he will come to terms with what it means to be a man within the lion family. We don't hurt, we don't hit, but we help and we hug. We help those who are hurting. We don't walk all over them. We advocate for the hurting and the marginalized. We advocate for righteousness despite the pressures. And as he grows up, he is going to grow more and more in what it means to be a lion. And in a similar fashion, we identify with Christ. And day by day, month by month, year by year, we grow into what it means to be a child of God. We grow from the cross, not to the cross. We go from the cross. And we're going to stumble. Just like McCoy, he's going to stumble. Lord knows he's going to hit a kid. And I'm going to have to tell him, don't do that again. Lord knows he's going to say something he shouldn't. He's probably going to bite you. Uh, but that's a point where I could say, hey, buddy, listen, that's not how we do it as a lion, is it? That's not how we do it. I'll respond with grace. And in a similar way, we're going to stumble our way through this. We're going to trip up on our way through this. But we have to remember and keep at the forefront of our minds that his grace is sufficient to cover a multitude of sins. And that there's no sin that you, could cre that you could commit that would keep you from the grace and mercy of God. Amen? It's a beautiful thing that there's grace in all aspects of our lives. So the second thing we see, once we, once we firmly ground our identity in Jesus, and once we firmly ground our identity in who he calls us to be, we see the significance of sex. We see the significance of sex. Physical intimacy is incredibly significant. Paul, as he's writing this, as he's writing this, he's writing to a community that is, is being indoctrinated uh, in two errors, two main errors. The first error is what I'm calling the platonic error, platonic error. Uh, it's this error that there's no boundaries with my body. Plato, who was a popular philosopher in the, in, in the time of Paul, uh, wrote things, purported that as humans, we are actually made up of two separate entities, where our body is a temporal entity and the soul is an eternal entity. And so this platonic dualism 
This platonic dualism, what it led to was this notion that we could live it up in our temporary selves because the soul is the only thing that's carrying on. So we got to live it up before the sink ships, right? We got to live it up. We got to do whatever the heck we want to do before I die, before I don't have my body anymore. I can't experience it. So I got to experience it all. And that, that's what Paul was writing to here. That's what Paul was writing. That was the community that Paul was writing to there. You hear stories or accounts of the, Corinth, the church in Corinth, and it was messed up, and dudes were doing things, being physically intimate with their mother-in-laws and all sorts of weird things, and Paul was writing to it. They were steeped in this culture that uh, was saying, hey, live it up, that your, that your desire to be physically intimate is the same desire for you to be hungry or and to want to eat food. So just like you would get a sandwich real quick, run up in Subway and get a sandwich, same way you go just take care of that desire real quick. Just real quick. There was temples with thousands of physical intimacy workers, if you know what I'm saying. Thousands. Corinth was known for having thousands. It was near this, this dock, this port, and so you got all the sailors running through. These sailors have been doing this from the jump, you guys. Thousands. Thousands. And so these Corinthians had access wherever they went to be physically intimate with somebody just to get rid of that desire. And that's why Paul says, in verse 9, but if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. What does it mean to be burn, to be burning with passion? It's, it means to be so absorbed in your desire that you can't help but act on it. Isn't it an interesting thing? Isn't it an interesting thing that, um, that, that, that uh, burning with passion... This, 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 physically in, this desire to be physically intimate, to be consumed by this intimacy, uh, this, is, this is a bad thing, Paul is saying here. He's saying this is, this is not good to live in light, to be mastered by this desire. But in culture, we say that it's freedom. It's an interesting thing that in culture, we say it's freedom to be able to act on this desire. It's freedom to be able to be physically intimate with whoever we want. But in doing so, we become enslaved to the desire. I have to look at that. I have to, I can't, I can't not. Well, I, I've got, I've got to, to, to go see what's up with her. I gotta see what's up with him. We become a slave to the desire under this notion of freedom. It's twisted, but that's how lies work. So Paul is saying it's better to get married than to burn with desires. And the other error that was being purported was in response to this was the, uh, uh, is the aesthetic error. Aesthetic error, which is the rejection of all pleasure. So you had people in the church in Corinth who were saying, listen, if pleasure is, is this bad thing that is being misused and abused in culture, we're just going to go the other way. And we're going to say, hey, the only time where you should be physically intimate with your spouse is when you're trying to create a baby. And so there's this swing of the pendulum into this asceticism. I'm, I'm going to abstain from that pleasure. And Paul would say, you're missing the point. He would say, you're missing the point when he says, do not withhold from one another. Do not withhold from one another. What Paul would say to us is, Physical intimacy is important. It's to be valued and it's to be practiced often. So do the dang thing and do it often. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And it's significant. Tim Keller points out in his article, Sex and the Gospel, he points out that physical intimacy is significant in that it's about procreation which it's not all about procreation, but when you think about it, you are co-laboring with the God of the universe to create souls when you're being physically intimate with the intentions of creating a little one. Think about that. You are co-laboring with God to create souls. Second, it's about delight. 
It's, it's about mutual concern and fulfillment. And it's a picture of the Trinity, the triune God that would, um, that would uh, be self-sacrificing and self-submitting. It's this mutualism, this dance of mutualism where true fulfillment isn't about me getting mine, but you getting yours. It's self-sacrificing and finally it's unifying. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 24 we read that a man and a woman become one when they come under a covenant and consummate their marriage. They become one and so every time we're physically intimate from that day, we're drawing back in our minds. We're remembering. We're remembering that covenant. We're remembering our oneness. We're remembering the self-sacrificial nature of our marriage. We're remembering, we're bringing to light, we're bringing to the forefront of our mind's eye the importance of our covenant and our oneness. So it's significant in that it procreates, it delights, and it unifies. There's so much more significance in physical intimacy, but I have a minute and 44 seconds left. So finally, healthy sexuality. Paul tells us a little bit about what healthy sexuality looks like in first corinthians 7 3 through 5 we read that the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband for the wife does not have authority over her own body but the husband does likewise the husband does not have authority over his own body but the wife does do not deprive do not withhold one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer but then come together again so that satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control what we're seeing here is a few things one that physical intimacy needs to be protected paul talks about the boundaries a physical intimacy when he says, hey, physical intimacy is meant for a man and a woman under the covenant of marriage. You protect important things. You protect significant things. Just like you wouldn't leave your passport or your social security card on your front porch. Just like I wouldn't let McCoy run around downtown Tacoma unsupervised. You protect significant things. And so Paul is saying within the confines, within the boundaries, the healthy boundaries of marriage, do the dang thing. But don't do it outside of these boundaries. It's too special. It's too sacred. It's too significant. I don't remember which pastor talked about this, but one preacher talks about it being like a fire. You want your fire in the fireplace. You want your fire in the fire pit. You want your fire in the grill, but you don't want your fire on the rug. You didn't want your fire on the couch. You want it protected by the boundaries of the brick. You want it protected by the boundaries of the stone or the metal to protect it so that it doesn't wreak havoc. And so physical intimacy needs to be protected. The second principle we see here is physical intimacy in marriage is a really good thing. It's a really good thing to be physically intimate in your marriage. What does God say after he created all things, after he created mankind and created physical intimacy? What does he step back and say? That's really good right there. That's some good stuff right there. Sometimes we think of physical intimacy as a byproduct of the fall. But it was around when Adam and Eve were walking around in their birthday suits in the garden, eyeing each other. That's a nice patch of grass. Shall we? It was a good thing. And it is a good thing. It's a really good thing. I love what John Mark Comer says in his book, Loveology. He points to the fact that the general messaging within the church has been don't, don't, don't around physical intimacy. But the overarching message in scripture is do it. Do it in the confines of marriage, in the boundaries that God has provided us. Do it. It's good. It's beautiful. And so that's why Paul says, hey, don't deprive each other. Don't withhold, except for short periods of time, of mutual consent. Now, what I want you to hear, sadly, 
And sinfully, this verse has been leveraged as a biblical ammo to coerce and leverage physical intimacies in relationships. And I have to tell you right now that that is not uh, what this passage is to be used for. So if you're wondering why your spouse does not want to be physically intimate with you after you use this verse against them, uh, that's why. You should probably take them on a date and say, I'm sorry. But really, this passage is not to be used as ammo to be leveraged against the other. That's not the disposition of Christ. Remember, the way we treat our spouses is a mirror of the way that the Trinity operates. We look to the character and person of Christ, and we try and seek to emulate that in our marriage. So we don't use Scripture to try to get our way. There will be seasons before and after pregnancy, hard seasons financially where stress is abundant, where y'all aren't physically intimate on a regular basis. And if you're here, you're single, engaged, or newlyweds, you need to write this down, that there will be seasons where you're not going to be physically intimate. Culture has given us this image that, hey, you step into marriage and you like two freaks getting after it. That's not typically what it's like, rarely what it's like. It's this intimate learning of one another, growing in physical intimacy with one another, grounded, predicated. These seeds are sown in the soil of emotional and relational intimacy. It's not, you don't just jump right in it. It's this process of learning. It's this dance. It's the tango. It's the salsa. You're learning the other person over time and grace with mutual submission, loving the other person, seeking to fulfill the other person. So this is what we see in Scripture. This is what we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, that our sexuality is not our identity, that it is significant, but it's not of the most significance. And in that, in a healthy way, it's done protected under the confines of marriage, and it's done frequently in self-sacrificial manners. I want to close um, by just acknowledging that some of us in this room are hearing this and you're feeling some sort of way maybe. Maybe you're feeling conviction or shame. I know I did. Back to that message. I remember it clearly. The duct tape. And sitting there. And every time he pulled that duct tape apart, feeling the shame. Feeling the shame, feeling the conviction, feeling the condemnation that I wasn't good enough anymore. That I was just a piece of used duct tape. Maybe you can relate. And what I want to communicate to you this morning is that no matter what, in the core of it all, in the core of this message, in the core of the message of the gospel, that Jesus is crazy about you and there's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can do about how crazy Jesus is for you. He is so crazy for you that he took your sins, past, present, and future, to that cross. And he died with your sins on his shoulder so that you might be reconciled back to God. So that you may be washed white as snow. Not doesn't matter what you've done, what you've experienced. That Jesus is the one who makes you worthy. And when we believe on him, when we submit our lives, when we cast ourselves upon the mercy of Christ, we are given that grace. We are given that mercy. We are cleansed. We are cleansed. You're in the right place. You are in the right place today. In a place where we lead with grace. We lead with kindness. This is a conversation. It's not a talk for once a year. This is a conversation. I'm here for you. The pastoral staff is here for you. And if you've yet to realize and fully grasp the weight of the truth that Jesus is here for you, I want to invite you to step back in the back with Pastor Ami or I. We'd love to pray for you. We'd love to pray with you. We also have a team, a pastoral team, that if you need someone to talk to about this, if you need a woman to talk to about this, If you need a man, we have a staff that is ready to sit with you, to pray with you, to cry with you, to laugh with you, and to journey on this long journey with you. And so I just want to encourage you 
that Jesus' grace is sufficient. Doesn't matter where you've been, who you've been with, his grace is sufficient to cover all that. Amen? So Jesus, we just thank you so much for your grace. We thank you so much for your mercy. We thank you that that you have cleansed us, that it doesn't matter what we've done or what's been done to us, that, that you desire to give us grace. You desire to give us healing. You desire to right the wrongs. You desire to mend. You desire to repair. God, we thank you that that you are after our whole self, not just a facet of who we are, but our whole self, God. And I just pray that as a community that we would ground ourselves in that, in the love, in the person, in the word of Christ. So God, we just pray that in this next time of worship, God, that you would be ministering to our hearts and leading us, leading us to your mercy and reminding us that you love us, that you went to great lengths so that we might have life and life abundantly, both present and eternally in you, Jesus. Pray all this in your mighty name. Amen.